Sins that block the Holy Spirit and angels. Number 1. The sin that blocks the Holy Spirit. The untold truth about the Holy Spirit. In our faith journey, it's essential to grasp the importance of the Holy Spirit in defeating sin, a key lesson for every follower of Christ. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit is not just some vague idea. Instead, it's a core member of the Trinity, which includes God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In the words of Jesus himself as recorded in John 14 verse 26, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. This passage reveals two essential truths. The Holy Spirit is a distinct personality within the Trinity and the role he plays in guiding and comforting those who follow Christ. Who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit, along with the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ, forms what we call the Trinity. This means that God shows himself in three different ways, yet he is still one God. Think of it like a team where each member has a unique role, but together they make one complete group. The Holy Spirit is as divine and mighty as God the Father and Jesus the Son. While this concept might seem complex, the Bible gives us plenty of evidence to believe this is true. It's like having a puzzle when you put all the pieces together, you see the whole picture. That's how we understand the Trinity, including the Holy Spirit, by piecing together everything the Bible tells us. Sin that stops you from hearing the Holy Spirit Sin isn't just about breaking rules. It deeply impacts our relationship with God. Picture the perfect world in the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve were close to God, just like friends are. However, when they sinned, it caused a huge rift, pushing humanity away from God. The Bible tells us that sin altered our ability to sense and comprehend God's presence and intentions. The first thing that blocks the Holy Spirit is unconfessed sin. In the book of Psalms, David shares his personal story about the trouble he faced when he didn't admit his wrongdoings. He talks about how important it is to be honest about our mistakes and seek forgiveness. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. Psalm 32 verse 3 David felt stuck in his spiritual life because he didn't admit his wrongdoing and this bothered him in sight. John writes, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous, so that he will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all the unrighteousness. 1 John 1 verse 9 Confession and repentance are the acts of turning away from sin and turning back to God, clearing the path for the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Another sin that blocks us is pride. King Saul shows us a clear lesson about how pride can create a wall between us and God. In the story of 1 Samuel 15, we see Saul making a big mistake. Instead of following God's instructions to destroy all of the Amalekites' animals, he chose to keep the best ones. When the prophet Samuel questioned him, Saul tried to deny his actions, which showed just how prideful he was. This pride was the reason he'd lost his position as king. This story is a powerful reminder that letting pride control us can make us spiritually deaf, unable to hear or follow God's guidance but he gives a greater grace. Therefore it says God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. James 4 verse 6 Pride can get in the way of listening to what the Holy Spirit wants to tell us. This happens because being too proud can make us think we are more important than we really are and that we can do everything by ourselves. So, we end up believing that our own ideas are better than God's advice. These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. 
The combination of all these things is regarded as abominable. While these things aren't the only sins to avoid, they do encompass the majority of the evils that God condemns. The sins that deal with the individual's deep heart motives are the seven things God despises. Sin is committed at the point it is conceived in the heart, even before it is actually committed. Avoiding these seven things God despises will assist us in revealing our hidden intentions and motives. The following are Proverbs 7 things that God despises. Arrogant, haughty eyes. This describes a sense of pride and a tendency to look down on others. Philippians 2 verses 5 to 11. Philippians 2 verse 3. Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility consider one another as more important than yourselves. Philippians 2 verses 5 to 11. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross, for this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. When we begin to think of ourselves more highly and with unparalleled importance, we are forgetting the fact that anything good in us is the result of Christ living in us and that the old self is now dead. Galatians 2 verse 20 I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Often, believers feel superior to other believers when they receive godly wisdom and display amazing tenacity against sin. They fail to recognize that these gifts were bestowed by God through Christ and fanned into the flame by the Holy Spirit, not by our own goodness. This sin of pride is so detested by the Lord that Paul was kept from committing this sin by being provided with a thorn in the flesh to humble him. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 7 Because of the extraordinary greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Bitterness and Unforgiveness Jesus tells us the story of a servant who, after being forgiven a great debt, refuses to forgive a small debt owed by another. The parable ends with the unforgiving servant being handed over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. Matthew 18 verse 34. This illustrates the spiritual imprisonment that comes with unforgiveness. Holding on to bitterness and not forgiving others can interfere with the Spirit's work in us. As Ephesians 4 verse 31 to 32, all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and slander must be removed from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. The importance of this truth for the successful Christian life cannot be overstated. Christ himself places particular emphasis on the need to forgive others. In Matthew 6 verses 9 to 15, he tells us, Pray then in this way, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive other people for their offenses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive other people, then your Father will not forgive your offenses. Of all the parts of the Lord's Prayer, 
It is intriguing that the only passage about which Jesus thought it worthy to make specific comment was the one on forgiveness. Notice that he lays down the proportion in which we can ask forgiveness from God. It is the same proportion in which we forgive others. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. When we fully forgive others, we can fully ask God to forgive us. But if we deny total forgiveness to others, then we cannot demand complete forgiveness from God. Then Jesus interjects, For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. A language could not be clearer. Do we want God to pardon us? Then we have no choice. We have to forgive others. There is no alternative to that. In Mark 11, Jesus is speaking about how to get our prayers answered. Therefore I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you have received them, and they will be granted to you. And whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you for your offenses. Mark 11 verses 24 to 25 When we pray, Jesus puts on us the responsibility to forgive others. He does not say, wait until they come and ask for your forgiveness. If you want your prayers to reach God, you take the initiative. Forgive these people. For the most part, I don't even think it's necessary to go to them and tell them. But you have to release them, because as long as you imprison them in their debts to you, God is holding out your debt to Him, and your debt to God is infinitely greater than the debt any person owes you. Jesus says, forgive him no matter what he has done. His language is so unimpaired. If you hold anything against anyone, forgive him. Anything against anyone. That leaves nothing and nobody out, doesn't it? This means that there are no situations or circumstances in which we can justify not forgiving others. Jesus is telling us that when you pray, believe that you receive what you are praying for as you pray. But he says there is an inherent problem. When you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Do you still have unanswered prayers? Have you sometimes felt that you were crying out and God's ears were stalled towards your prayer? Possibly God has been pausing for you to learn the message that if you want Him to hear your prayers, you must begin by forgiving anybody that you may be holding anything against. Jesus goes deeper into this question in His parable of the irreconcilable servant. It is so vivid, and we can all draw important lessons from this. Three keys. There are three important points to this parable. First of all, unforgiveness is wickedness. The master said to the servant, You wicked servant. That's a harsh indictment, isn't it? The first servant had not committed a heinous crime, he had simply failed to forgive his fellow servant. It appears that in God's opinion, failure to forgive is wickedness. Secondly, Jesus says that the master was angry. Unforgiveness provokes the wrath of God. Let us remember that there is a precise parallel between the Lord and the servant and with God and each one of us. My third observation is that unforgiveness imprisons us. An interpretation refers to the jailers as tormentors. King James Version Jesus said, My heavenly Father will deal with you exactly as that master dealt with his servant. That unforgiving servant was delivered to the tormentors. Restoring the ability to hear the Holy Spirit. Repentance. The gentle whisper of the Holy Spirit can be drowned out in our world today. Restoring the ability to hear this divine guide often requires a return to the foundational principles of repentance, forgiveness, humility, obedience, and community. Repentance is a powerful act not merely feeling sorry for wrongdoings, but a determined change in direction. Acts 3 verse 19 says, Therefore repent and return, 
so that your sin may be wiped away, in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. This refreshing speaks to a restorative power of repentance. It cleanses the conscience and unblocks the channels to God. By acknowledging our sins and deciding to turn away from them, we effectively remove the debris that clogs our spiritual ears. There are two words that are believed to be the same as repentance but are not. The first is regret. Many people have regrets about how they have lived their lives. I'd be astonished if anyone listening didn't have regrets about any of their life decisions. Because regrets are feelings about what you've done to yourself, what you've done with your own life, and your own decisions. The second word is what we call remorse, which is how we feel about what we have done to others. That, however, is not repentance. Repentance has this unique feature, that repentance is what you feel you have done to God. That's a big difference between regret and remorse. Suddenly, you understand it's God who has been hurt most, just as the prodigal son realized that it wasn't just his father who had been hurt. Luke 15 verse 21 And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And as soon as that heaven dimension enters in, and you understand it's God who has been hurt the most, and you understand it's God's laws you've broken, God's love you've spurned, God's anger you've aroused, God's judgment you deserve, it's God's mercy you'll need. It becomes the godly grief that leads to repentance. As Paul puts it, 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10, regret and remorse do not necessarily lead to repentance. Repentance in the New Testament is divided into three stages, thought, word, and deed. I'm going to show you that repentance is always repentance of particular sins. You can't repent of general sins, and this entails the following three phases, thought, word, and deed. It entails, first and foremost, changing your perspective about certain issues and thinking in God's manner about them. And you come to two conclusions as a result of this. First, God is far better than I had imagined. And second, I am a far worse person than I had imagined. In the world, in the world today, it's usually the opposite way around. When an unbeliever thinks about God, he thinks God is unfair and that he is fair and that he is superior to God. Have you taken notice of this? The number of people who say, why does God do this? What gives God the right to do that? Why should God operate like that? They are implying, I know better than God. That's exactly what they're saying. And they're positioning themselves as superior beings to God. They are claiming, he's making errors that I wouldn't make. He's behaving in ways that I wouldn't. As a result, I am a better person than he. The second step is the word of repentance, and that means first to confess sins. In the New Testament, there is no confession of general sin. There are only numerous confessions of sins plural. If you are bitter, it's because you have decided to resent rather than forgive what has been done to you. Mankind's most basic need is repentance. That makes it possible for God to forgive. You are saying, I am what I am now because I chose at crucial points of my life a way that leads to this character. We are all the outcome of our choices, and treating someone with the dignity of a human being means treating them as responsible for their actions. It isn't a Pavlovian dog. You're telling someone, you are a living creature, you have made your decision. We choose our friends, the company we keep, and the goals we pursue. We made the decision. We make decisions, and confession means admitting that. I made the wrong decision and I'm responsible. That's the beginning of lifting a person to the dignity of a responsible human being and getting them to express it in words is crucial. If we confess our sins, not our sin, if we confess our sins, which means name them one by one, just as you do your blessings, then he is faithful and just to forgive each one of our sins. 1 John 1 verse 9 And his blood continues to cleanse us, a lovely promise. Forgiveness The pursuit of forgiveness is central to Christianity, rooted in the Lord's Prayer. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. 
Matthew 6, verse 12. To hear the Holy Spirit, one must seek forgiveness from God for their sins, a divine reset that restores spiritual harmony. Moreover, seeking forgiveness from those we have wronged is equally important, as it is written in Matthew 5, verses 23 to 24. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. Reconciliation with others reduces the noise of guilt and conflict, making the voice of the Holy Spirit more discernible. Humility and Obedience Being humble is like having good soil where your ability to take in and grow from spiritual experiences can thrive. James 4 verse 6 reminds us that, But He gives us a greater grace. Therefore it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. A humble person is more willing to follow directions, and when we do and we're told, we get better at hearing what God wants to tell us. My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. John 10 verse 27 When we submit our wills to God, we not only hear His voice more clearly, but we are also empowered to follow it. Community and Accountability No believer is an island. We are called to live in community. Galatians 6 verse 2 encourages believers to carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. A community provides accountability, ensuring that we remain on the path of righteousness. When we stray, a brother or sister in Christ can gently guide us back, ensuring that our spiritual lives remains unobstructed. Hebrews 10 verses 24 to 25 underscores the importance of this fellowship. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Number 2. The Sins That Blocks Angels Angels are powerful ministering spirits. However, certain things may hinder their ministry in our lives. The first thing that can hinder angels is spiritual blindness. Whenever it comes to issues of God, you are required to believe it before you can experience it. Whatever is written in the Word must be seen before it can be possessed. Angels, who are also referred to as the host of heaven, are all around us. Elisha's servant was also initially ignorant of the fact, and Job never realized it. Don't let the devil confuse you about the presence of angels. Just as the demonic world is invisible, the angelic world is also invisible. Let us have a look at the story of Elisha. There was a time when Elisha became so unbeatable and a whole army was delegated to go and arrest him. 2 Kings 6 verses 14 to 17, New American Standard Bible. So he sent horses and chariots and a substantial army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. Now when the attendant of the man of God had risen early and gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots were circling the city. And his servant said to him, this is hopeless, my master. What are we to do? And he said, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are greater than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, Lord, please open his eyes so that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. What you cannot see, you cannot utilize. What you cannot see, you cannot make use of. Can you see the mountain on which you stand is full of horses and chariots of fire? Angelic ministry was one of the most powerful ministries in the New Testament, which made the saints invincible. Angels were not ideologies to them, but real personalities and a usual and expected experience. When Peter knocked at Mary's door after his release from prison, those that were in the house assumed that it must be his angel at the door, not Peter himself. Also, 
it can be seen that there are no scriptural records to show that Peter expressed any shock or amazement at the appearance of an angel in the prison. The angels were very real beings to them. To have angelic intervention like they did, you will have to begin to operate in the invincible realm. Elisha prayed that the eyes of his servant might be opened and they were opened. Do the same prayer that you may see the true power of God in your life. Number 2. Fear A second hindrance to angelic ministry is fear, and that fear is a direct result of spiritual blindness. Elisha's servant cried, alas, but his master, recognizing the cause of his fear, cured his blindness. Fear torments and exposes man to the wicked operations of Satan. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 lets us know, For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Isaiah 8 verses 12 to 13, New American Standard Bible. You are not to say it is a conspiracy, regarding everything that this people call a conspiracy, and you are not to fear what they fear or be in dread of it. It is the Lord of armies whom you are to regard as holy, and he shall be your fear, and he shall be your dread. By fearing those things which men fear, and thinking the way they think and talking the way they talk, walking the way they walk, the enemy uses this to his benefit and steals the extraordinary angelic interventions of others. There are about 365 instances in the Bible where God says, fear not, or be not afraid, while the word angels also appeared about 300 times. If you can hold on to the word of God and obey his command not to fear, you will see your angels at work. Make God your refuge dwelling against every opposing part of the devil. Make God only your fear and your dread, and he will build a defense around you just as he said in Psalm 34 verse 7, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Until we overcome fear, we do not have access to angelic ministry, but God, in his mercy, has made provisions to destroy the yoke and bondage of fear. How do you deal with fear? Knowledge Daniel tells us, the people that do not know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Daniel 11 verse 32 The knowledge of God establishes strength on your insights. When you realize the worth of God, you understand what He can do and you let go of fear. The consciousness of God's presence in your life takes away fear. An awareness of the ever-abiding presence of God establishes excellent confidence in you which overrides every fear. The psalmist said, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Psalm 23 verse 4 Jesus also assures us, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Matthew 28 verse 20 As you overcome the twin hindrances of spiritual blindness and fear, you become knowledgeable that the forces with you are stronger than those of any opposition and then you will be at rest. When you are at peace, God is at work. God says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Psalm 46 verse 10. Then your angels are activated and are ready to take various guides from you and you make use of the right keys to set them loose. Have faith in God that when you are anointed, there is an impartation of the spirit of boldness that makes you despise things you formerly feared. You must realize that the anointing teaches all things. Therefore, as the yoke of fear is broken, more knowledge into God and His ways is also imparted, and more revelation means more strength, and more strength equals less fear. The second way to get rid of fear is by the anointing. The Bible tells us that the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. You can anoint yourself against the spirit of fear, particularly when you are out in battle. After the Holy Ghost came on the apostles, they spoke the word of God with such boldness that all those around took notice. 
Finally, take note that you are born again. It is necessary to remind ourselves that angelic ministrations are saints limited, i.e. restrictions only to people who have been saved and sanctified by the blood of the Lamb and have their names written in the book of life. In other words, you have to be born again before you can enjoy the ministry of angels or get them to work on your behalf or at your request. God said, I am the Lord, I change not. Hence, what he did in the past, he is still doing in the present. He cannot change. The Bible does not exist merely for information, but for our instruction and for guidelines on what to do and not do in similar situations and circumstances. The things that were written aforetime were written for our learning, so we need to look deep into the Word, to locate the master keys and principal ways which the early saints employed for the effective release of their angels. However, before considering what to do, let us first note not what to do. That is, the factors that might obstruct or delay angelic ministrations, even in the lives of the heirs of salvation. We pray that you were blessed by this video. Make sure that you like and subscribe, and also watch our other videos here. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather in your presence today, we come with hearts burdened by the weight of our shortcomings and transgressions. We acknowledge that we have strayed from your path, and we seek your forgiveness and mercy. Grant us the strength and humility to turn away from our sins and embrace your boundless love and grace. Lord, we repent for the times we have neglected your commandments and followed our own desires. We ask for your forgiveness for the moments when we have hurt others with our words and actions. Help us to recognize the areas in our lives where we need to change and grow closer to you. Forgive us, O oh God, for the times we have harbored resentment and held grudges against those who have wronged us. Teach us the true meaning of forgiveness, that we may extend it to others just as you have graciously forgiven us. Help us to release bitterness from our hearts and replace it with your peace and compassion. We pray for the courage to seek reconciliation with those whom we have wronged and to offer sincere apologies. Grant us the wisdom to mend broken relationships and restore harmony in our communities. May your love be the guiding force that binds us together in unity and understanding. Lord, we lift up to you all those who are struggling to forgive themselves for past mistakes and failures. Pour out your healing balm upon their wounded spirits and reassure them of your unending mercy. Help them to embrace the truth of your forgiveness and to move forward with hope and confidence. We also remember those who have been deeply wounded by the actions of others. Comfort them in their pain, O God, and grant them the strength to forgive those who have caused them harm. May your healing touch bring restoration and wholeness to their lives, turning their scars into testimonies of your grace. Father, we confess that we often underestimate the power of your forgiveness and the depth of your love. Open our eyes to see the magnitude of your sacrifice on the cross and the extent of your mercy toward us. Let your love penetrate our hearts and transform us from the inside out. Help us to live lives that reflect your grace and mercy to the world around us. May we be quick to forgive as you have forgiven us. And may our actions bear witness to your redeeming love. Guide us in the paths of righteousness and lead us ever closer to you. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of repentance and forgiveness. May we never take it for granted, but always treasure it as a precious opportunity to draw nearer to you. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we may walk in obedience to your will and experience the fullness of your joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.